People ask me when I'm leading a service, you make your own sermon? Not a chance. That's a real gift. And people like Randy and uh, Pastor William, Pastor Jake, I really tip my hat to you for doing that because it's, it's not easy. The sermon that I've uh, picked this morning was written by Pastor... Henry Steinbergen, who was in Apisford at that time. I don't know where he is at this point, but I have to give credit to... I have to give credit. (laughs) It's titled, The Sounds of Silence. Dear friends in Christ, do you like silence? Do you like getting away by yourself sometimes and just enjoy some silence? Or do you feel uncomfortable with those times of silence? We all enjoy some times of quiet when we kick up, kick up our feet to just relax for a while socially after a busy day at home or work or after the busyness of a visit with family or friends. But silence can be pretty uncomfortable, too. For the young person who's out on a date, and there's that long pause. You wonder what your date's thinking about you. Silence can be uncomfortable for children who know they've done something wrong, and they wait for mom or dad to respond. Or they wait for the principal to come and to discipline them. Silence is difficult for parents whose adult children have wandered away from God. And they wait in silence for that situation to change. Silence can be unnerving as we wait for the doctor's word about our latest medical results. Probably the most uncomfortable kind of silence is when we feel that God is no longer speaking to us, when God seems far away and doesn't seem real to us, when we're disappointed with God, when we pray, but God doesn't seem to answer, when we try our best to serve God and there seem to be no tangible results. We cry out to God to grab his attention, but we're left only with that unsettling response of silence. That's a situation Elijah faced in our text this morning. Elijah was busy as a true prophet of God in Israel. He served in one of the worst times in Israel's history. King Ahab was one of Israel's worst kings ever. God had chosen Elijah to stand up to Ahab to tell him to turn away from the idolatrous gods of Baal. Ahab didn't take too kindly to Elijah's rebuke. He threatened to kill Elijah. Elijah, in turn, pronounced God's judgment on Israel. This led to a dramatic confrontation on Mount Carmel in chapter 18. It's what Jackie was alluding to, too, this morning in the children's message. There the prophets of Baal tried to make their god light their altar with fire to no avail. Elijah then called on the Lord, who struck the altar with fire in a most dramatic display of power. It resulted in Elijah slaughtering all the prophets of Baal. You would expect that Elijah would have been on a real spiritual high after this dramatic event. It didn't take long for the bubble to burst. Ahab's wife, the wicked queen Jezebel, wasn't impressed. Jezebel was too blind to recognize the Lord as the one true God. She promised to kill Elijah, and this caused Elijah to flee for his life. This was all very depressing for Elijah. 
the events on Mount Carmel seemed to have no effect. He thought for sure that Israel would wake up and smell a coffee, that Israel would realize that serving Baal was just plain foolishness. It didn't happen. Instead of Israel returning and turning in repentance to the living God, they continued with their poisonous Baal worship. Elijah saw no point in continuing his work as prophet. If Israel wouldn't humble itself before God after this awesome power of display, nothing would ever change their sinful ways. Elijah was at the end of his rope. His best efforts to witness to the true God of heaven went unheeded. Everywhere he looked, he saw only spiritual indifference to God. He might as well throw in the towel and quit. He lost all confidence that God's kingdom would still win out over Satan's forces of evil. And these are my words now. As I read this, this, I thought, how how could Israel not believe? But look look at our own lives. If we experienced all those miraculous signs, what would we, what would it be our reaction? I wonder. I don't think we'd be any better than the Israelites. Some of us can relate to Elijah's disappointment. We see the declining influence of the church in an increasingly hostile secular society. We sense a growing sense of complacency within the church itself. We sometimes wonder about the church's future. We diligently do our part to build up the work of Christ's church, but sometimes we question whether it's even worth the effort when the children, the young people, or the adults we work with hardly seem to care what we're trying to say or do for them. We try our best to be a witness to the neighbor or fellow worker. We don't see any noticeable change. We wonder if it's just a waste of time. Should I just shut my mouth and give up? We might be parents of children who've turned away from God and the church. For years, our prayers have gone unanswered. Why doesn't God use our efforts to reach out to them? Maybe we just don't feel very close to God and this time our efforts to pray are like talking to a brick wall. Reading the Bible doesn't do much for us. We feel like the young person who shared with his pastor how God doesn't seem very real in his life. If only God would reveal himself to me in some dramatic way, I'd have no problem believing in God. Isn't that the way it is for many of us? We want God to show himself in some dramatic way. Show us a miracle. Then we'll have no problem believing in God. Elijah had seen a miracle, yet with disappointing results. He now wanted some space to think things over for a while. He fled to Mount Horab, which is another name for Mount Sinai where God had initially established his covenant with Israel. The covenant that Israel had so blatantly broken. Maybe God would reveal himself to Elijah in some dramatic way, like God had done for Moses and Israel so many years before. Elijah did receive a revelation from God. It was much different than he expected God asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What a silly question Elijah must have thought. Couldn't God see what was going on? I've worked zealously for God, often under difficult circumstances. What do I have to show for it? A bunch of good-for-nothing people who could care less what I say or do. Hey, God, 
Don't you see their idol worship? Haven't you noticed how they've killed all your faithful servants? Listen, God, I'm the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me too. It's no use. You might just as well let me die. Elijah had good reasons for his frustration and for thinking that God should shake Israel in some dramatic way to bring them back to their senses. Maybe some of us feel that God should do the same for his church today. But Elijah had forgotten something very important in this despairing time when everything seemed so bleak. He forgot that God was still in control of the situation. While Elijah had given himself 100% to God's cause, it was obvious that Elijah was taking himself far too seriously. He could turn the Lord's cause into his, he had turned the Lord's cause into his own cause. He thought he could change things in Israel by his own efforts. He now realized his best efforts had failed. He figured the Israelites should be banging on his door, begging him to teach them more about this loving God. It didn't happen. Is it any wonder why Elijah was so depressed? Is it any wonder he fled into the wilderness like this? God told Elijah to stand on the mountain. There he would experience the presence of God. Imagine the anticipation Elijah must have felt. He fully expected another awesome display of God's power to assure him of God's presence. Suddenly, a strong wind almost blew Elijah off his feet. Surely, God must be in that wind. No, not in the wind. Then the earth started shaking so hard. Was that God? Nope, not in the earthquake. Then a fiery flash of fire scared the daylights out of Elijah. But there wasn't so much as a peep out of God. When the fireworks were all done, a terrible hush fell over the mountain. It was a deep silence. Suddenly, Elijah heard something. Only the ear of faith could hear that gentle whisper coming from God. Yet the message was loud and clear. There was no longer any question who had been the star on Mount Carmel. It definitely wasn't Elijah, as he was inclined to think before. Elijah had to learn the painful truth that he couldn't just make Israel change her ways with the quickness of a magician pulling a rabbit from a hat. The lesson's clear for us. We sometimes try to manipulate God like a circus ringmaster who coaxes his, a lion to jump through a fiery hoop. It's not through our efforts that people will change or the church will change. Only God can do that through his spirit. Sure, God uses our human efforts for his purposes. But sometimes God doesn't do his work until we get out of the way. The stillness of God was too much for Elijah. He covered his face in the stillness, Elijah was again asked, what are you doing here, Elijah? God wanted Elijah to see how he had lost sight of the power of God's grace. Elijah answered with the same words as before. This time, it wasn't so much a complaint as an expression of despair over his failure to leave it all in God's hands. Elijah learned the hard way that God's kingdom is never, never a lost cause. 
Elijah had to learn that no human effort will ever destroy the powers of sin and evil. God still uses our human efforts, yet even our best efforts will never win the battle against evil. That's why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to atone for our sin and to put a harness over Satan, the evil one. Jesus is God's reassurance that he is in control, that God's kingdom purposes will always come about, that God will bring about his redemptive purposes here on earth, even when all human evidence suggests the contrary. Like Elijah, we're called to give our best efforts for God, but then we need to rest and leave the results in God's hand. That's not an easy lesson for us to learn. It's difficult to step back and let God take over. We want to be in charge. We don't like waiting for the sounds of silence, waiting for God to do things in his way and by his timetable. Isaiah 55 reminds us, God's ways are always higher than our ways. God's kingdom plan often takes routes we can neither plan nor understand. God often takes us through the unsettling detours of muddy side roads. Not always fun. The bumps, the curves, the 30-kilometer zones make us impatient. We prefer the easy route of the freeway. We want life to be clear sailing. Shift it into cruise control and let the kilometers fly by. What God wants us to do is slow down from the busyness, the crowds, and noise of our hectic lifestyles. God even wants to slow us down at times from the busyness of our church activities. God knows he can't get our attention when we're racing around like crazy people shouting for attention. God never elbows his way to the front of the crowd to get himself noticed. God doesn't usually speak to us through a loudspeaker or dramatic miracles. God wants to slow us down to enable us to hear his small voice as he speaks through us through his word. God sometimes even allows painful struggles or tragedies into our lives to bring about such a silence. In this backdrop of silence, we begin to ask, where is God? Are you disappointed with God or his people? Then stop to ask, have I stopped to listen to the gentle whisper of God? That's not always easy. Many of us have a hard time being silent before God. We're so busy telling God how rough we have it in our lives and how we want him to arrange things differently. God says to us, as he did to Elijah, just be quiet and listen. Listen to what God has to say. Listen to how God came into this world through his son in the stillness of a night on one of the back streets of Bethlehem some. 2,000 years ago. Everyone was too busy in the overcrowded inns to even notice what was going on. That God was bringing about his redemptive purposes in a quiet, inconspicuous way, the way of humble servanthood through Jesus our Savior from sin. Friends, don't miss his, call, his voice calling out to you. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Only the believer who stops to listen will hear this gentle whisper and trust it in it as the voice of God. 
When Elijah had heard the gentle whisper from God, God told him, get back to work. From the quietness, Elijah was summoned to continue with the challenging work of God's kingdom. God wanted to, him to appoint three instruments through whom God would bring about his judgment and change within Israel. More importantly, God assured Elijah that as bleak as things were, there were still 7,000 people in Israel who remained faithful to him. Elijah wasn't alone. God would still use such people to work out his covenant promises. With the assurance of God's faithfulness, we can get up from the quietness of listening to the small, still voice of God's word, and we can obey his call to get to work as his instruments of love and grace in this world. When we believe what God has whispered to us as truth, we shout out this truth to those who are caught up in the confused voices of this world. We shout out the good news of God's message of forgiveness and salvation in Jesus. That's not easy to do when our secular society often tries to silence our witness for Jesus. We continue our loud shout knowing that we can prayerfully leave it to God to change the hearts of those who hear our gospel message. A message that's not loud in the terms of the noise we make, but a message that's loud when it touches people with the same sacrificial love that God has shown to us in Jesus. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, a day that you have given us to slow down from some of our busy activities and gather for worship, a day to remind us of how you want us to live for you and serve you in this world. Do what you need to do, Lord, to slow us down in the busyness of our lives and to keep us from listening only to the voices and noises of this world. Draw us into some quiet place to open your word with the openness to hear your still, small voice. Assure us that even in the midst of our struggles, disappointments, and questions in life, you are always still at work to bring about your redemptive purposes for us and this world. Inspire us anew, equip us anew with your Holy Spirit to get back to work with renewed enthusiasm in your kingdom activity, in our words and in our actions. Keep this church faithful in serving you in the work of building up your kingdom purposes in this community and throughout the world. Amen.